On Tech News Today, Google's inbox now answers your emails so you don't have to. Plus, Amazon opens their brick and mortar store and Google cancels theirs. And a major drone maker launches a computer that will bring artificial intelligence to quadcopters. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, November 3rd, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Prosper. Prosper is a peer to peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash TNT to apply for a loan now. And by Gazelle, the online marketplace for buying and selling used gadgets. Shop from a variety of certified pre-owned electronics or trade one in for cash. Give a new life to a used device. Visit gazelle.com today. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news of the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today is After Nines and Channel ETE content czar Joe Panettiere. Hey, Joe, Joe, how you doing today? I'm doing great, Mike. How's your week treating you so far? Not bad, not bad. Of course, it's only Tuesday. It, it could all go really horribly wrong. So still have <laughs> three days. No, I'm an optimist. It's going to be a great week. Uh, today is a, a weird and s slow but weird news day with a couple of nuggets of information that are really, really interesting. Uh, one of them isn't that Twitter <laughs> Twitter has uh, hearts now instead of stars. So they got rid of their like little favorite star, and they added a little heart. And when you click on a heart, it sort of explodes, <laughs> exploding heart. Uh, and uh, yeah, progress. <laughs> what are you going to do? I think hearts are going to take over, actually. I think they're going to take over from, you know, we've heard that Facebook uh, is going to have a small number, uh, possibly going to have a small number of emoticons, one of which is a heart. Uh, and, of course, you know, Tumblr has hearts. Somebody's going to have hearts. It's a kindler, gentler world, isn't it, Mike? It really is. And, uh, and so... We'll see. Uh, so far, people seem to enjoy it. Well, let's jump into our top story. Google Inbox can reply to your emails so you don't have to. The new feature is called Smart Reply, and it's going to be rolled out this week starting tomorrow for the iOS and Android Google Inbox apps. Smart Reply generates three short replies, and if you like one of them, you can just select it and hit send. Here's the interesting part. The replies are created by a deep neural network geared uh, that's optimized for natural language processing. It's AI designed with your help to pass the Turing test, essentially. It not only comes up with relevant content for your reply, but also the appropriate tone, according to Google. And hilariously, Google said on the Google Research blog today that an earlier version tended to offer I love you as a reply to almost everything. It was like Borat or something. Google has since uh, tweak tweaked the system to make it less loving. Uh, Joe, I think this is really interesting because, of course, lots of companies have been working on Essentially, artificial intelligence chatbots, chatbots that can converse with you in real time. Microsoft's got a great one in China, but lots of companies have been working on this. And Google took their chatbot technology, essentially, and they basically are using it to, instead of reply to, to humans, to offer you some options, and then you pick one, and then the one you pick, you, know, you can pick none, and then answer yourself, but is essentially using a human being as an editor for the chatbot. Really fascinating application, I think. It is pretty interesting. And Mike, let's take it a step further. So let's assume you use that in a reply to me, right? And now I get your artificial intelligence reply into my inbox. Am I now using AI to reply back? And, and basically, does this <laughs> become a, a, complete, a complete machine to machine communication with with you and I having less and less interaction. And really, um, it, it, it's almost like uh, the old game of Pong set on uh, autoplay, isn't it? It is. And I think, well, I think in the future it will be. Right now it still requires a human to say, yeah, that one. Uh, go ahead and send it. Uh, but, of course, the way Google tends to do things, especially with Google Inbox, is that it wants to learn what you are likely to do. So my guess is that give it a couple of years or maybe less than, a year. Who knows how much time this will take? But I, I would guess that Google will basically say, okay, I see that every time this type of person sends you this kind of email, you always reply with this kind of answer. We're just going to go ahead and answer that for you in the future. Um, it'll probably be opt-in at first, but eventually <laughs> you're right. It's just our email applications are just going to be talking to each other and essentially leave us out of it. 
So won't that be great? We don't have to do email anymore. <laughs> we got some drone news coming right up. But first, I want to talk about Prosper, one of our sponsors today. You know, Pr uh, Pr Prosper is such a great place to borrow money. There are three steps to finding out what your rate is going to be with a Prosper loan. You just go to the site, and right there on the home page, you'll see that uh, there's a place for you to give basic information about yourself, your name, how much you'd like to borrow, and what you'd like to borrow it for. Put in your credit score. If you know your credit score, it's a range, so you don't know, have to know exactly what your current credit score is. Click a button, and you get your rate instantly without affecting your credit. Uh, now, if you want to get a loan for debt consolidation, that's a great idea. If you want to get a loan for home improvement, a uh, personal loan for business use, so you can grow or start uh, a, a small business, you can get a car or vehicle loan, uh, buy a truck or a motorcycle. Uh, you can get a short-term and bridge loans with no prepayment penalties. You can even get a green loan. There's so many loan types that they offer, and that's how it works. Essentially, your personal private information, of course, is completely anonymized on the site. So when people go to uh, invest in your loan, they don't see any of your personal details. They just see what your loan is all about. And they see your credit, you know, they get a sense of what your credit is. And they choose the project to invest in. And they get a reasonable return. And you get a great loan. A great loan. And, of course, um, if you put all the information in right from the front, the, the loan is processed very fast. You can get up to $35,000 in as few as five days. And... It's just a great, great way to borrow. It's the best way to borrow. And, of course, they sparked an entire industry, and they still lead that industry. For up to $35,000 in your account in as few as five days, go to prosper.com slash TNT. That's prosper.com. And don't forget, after the dot com is slash TNT. And we thank Prosper for their support of Tech News Today. Well, Amazon today opened a new brick-and-mortar bookstore for some reason. <laughs> Elizabeth Weiss is a reporter for USA Today and joins us now. Hey, Elizabeth, how you doing? I am well. I'm on Prop F duty here, watch duty in San Francisco, waiting to see how the election goes, but also looking to what's going on up in Seattle. Yeah, this is, um, you know, a, a brick-and-mortar bookstore. Why are they doing this, Elizabeth? I, there's a couple of possibilities. I mean, it's it, it's fascinating. Amazon start people, I think, don't always remember this. Amazon started out as a bookstore. It started out as a bookstore in uh, Seattle. Well, on one of the first big online bookstores, basically destroyed the heart of American book selling. If you listen to some people, because brick and mortar stores couldn't afford to compete, and now, fifteen years later, they're opening a bookstore in Seattle. Uh, so it's, there's a couple of possibilities. I mean, one is people, books are an instant sell. You walk in, you see it, you want it in your hand because you want to start turning those pages. And so they've put it in a very nice, very upscale mall in Seattle called University Village. Uh, there's already, and what I think though is more interesting is there's already an Apple and a Microsoft store in that mall. So mm. you can walk in, you can check out, you know, the latest iPhone, you can go play with the latest Microsoft thing. Not only will this Amazon, it's called Amazon Books, this bookstore will not only sell books, it will also sell Amazon devices. And they're going to have a, they're, it's not a genius bar, but they're going to have a space where they will have Amazon employees who will allow you to play with and be shown Amazon devices. So there has been some discussion that perhaps especially in a place where we've got Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple all going head-to-head -head in the same physical space. Amazon's kind of testing out, do we have to show people our devices to get them to buy into our ecosystem? Mm. Hey, Elizabeth, building on this, have there been any clues as to whether or not Amazon plans to open more stores like this, or is this really prelim preliminary in terms of what they're up to? Amazon's not saying, uh, they told the Seattle Times that they're going to focus on this one first, but if if it all works out well, they would like to open more. So, I mean, that would be very interesting if they decided this was a, a way they wanted to go. I mean, to, books were always ancillary to Amazon's greater vision. I mean, they started out with books because it was kind of an easy, easy thing to ship and it was an easy thing to keep track of. And then, of course, they expanded into everything in the entire universe and maybe going to a brick and mortar bookstore is another way to start out slow and then perhaps expand into something else. Now, of course, the elephant in the living room is a behavior known as showrooming, which is where you go to a store 
you find the product that you'd like to buy, and then you pull out your phone and you buy it online for cheaper than the store is selling it. This is horrible news for your typical brick-and-mortar retailer. And, of course, it's one of the reasons that Amazon has been able to decimate uh, brick-and-mortar bookstores because people go to bookstores and they find the book they want. They flip through all the books. They take advantage of the fact that the brick-and-mortar store has a physical location. And then they go on Amazon.com and buy it for overnight delivery. The Amazon store is designed and optimized for and encouraging of showrooming, isn't it? It is. They So they've got it set up so that you could, they're happy to have you walk in and buy a book and walk out with it. But if you find a book that you like, you can order it right there and then and have it delivered to your house. And of course, if you're an Amazon Prime member, it's going to show up in two days and you're not going to pay shipping. And so they are, they're kind of making that a value add as opposed to a negative, which will be very interesting. And what will be fascinating is to see, I mean, I don't know that they'll ever give us this data, but will people buy the books there or will they wait and just have them shipped to their house? Yeah, that's a good point. And also it has to be said that Amazon uses the online ratings to decide which books to put in the store and so on. Elizabeth, you said at the top of this segment that you were on sort of the Proposition F uh, watch right now. Yes. Can you tell us about Proposition F? So in San Francisco, we have uh, Proposition F. It's one of 11 ballot measures on the ballot here. Prop F is uh, was put on the ballot by folks who are opposed to short-term rentals because they feel that they are driving up. They're taking necessary rental units off of the market and they're driving up prices. Prop F would restrict the number of days. This is really all about Airbnb, though. There are, of course, other short-term rental uh, websites out there. Uh, Prop F would say that if you are an Airbnb host or a host on another such site, you could not rent out a room for more than 75 days over the course of the year. Currently, you're restricted to 90. You couldn't rent out an in-law apartment. Um, and you would also have to, if you're a renter, you have to notify your landlord that you are, uh, oh, there's, I actually shot that. That was fun. Um, there, They would notify your you have to notify your landlord that you are going to be renting out a unit. You also have to notify everybody who lives within 100 feet of you that you will be renting out a unit. This has been a very hard-fought measure in San Francisco. Airbnb has put over $8 million into opposing it. Uh, folks who are for it say that we need it because San Francisco doesn't have enough housing. It's pushing people out. It's leading to evictions. People who are against it say that it's a way for middle-class folks to rent out a room or two they don't need and make ends meet in a city that is becoming increasingly expensive. And really, it's all kind of a proxy war for the coming, this most recent coming of serious tech money to San Francisco, which has really raised housing prices. It's created a tremendous housing shortage, and there's just a lot of angst in town about you know, what is happening to the San Francisco that was here when I got here? It's changed. And should we make it change back? And of course, San Francisco is the poster child for the sharing economy and the on-demand economy and Airbnb. And uh, along with Uber are the sort of poster children for that those movements. Um, it's sad to see this kind of opposition because, again, San Francisco is the city of the future right now because they have all these on-demand services. Like, uh, you know, uh, some some like Airbnb are headquartered in San Francisco and global, but many are just services you can only get within San Francisco. That's one of the most exciting things about San Francisco right now, I think. So we'll see how yeah, that goes. An apartment here, which you can't right now because the, the housing market here is so insane. I think that's part of the tension is that it's housing has gotten crazy in anything around housing. I mean, there's a couple of props on the ballot here that are all about housing. Yeah. Hey, hey, Mike, do you, do you mind if I jump in here? I mean, what, one other thought on this is is a lot of these these uh, escalated prices are tied to the unicorns and the multi-billion dollar startups. But if, if you track the, the venture capitalists right now, everybody's worried about a major correction coming. So it, it, I'm very curious to see if this is, uh, you know, the government trying to regulate a situation that's going to correct itself within a few months. And I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, so to speak, but I, I do think we're in for a correction soon. And I don't think these prices can maintain themselves going forward. Yeah. Well, in this, and in this instance, it's not the government. This was an uh, initiative that was put on the ballot by petition, which we do mm. a lot in San Francisco. Um, but I mean, you're right. Every, I mean, I've lived through a couple of booms and busts in San Francisco, and eventually it will all fall apart, and everybody will go home, and there will be <laughs> lots of parking for a while, and then it will go away again. 
Yeah, San Francisco and Berkeley as well uh, are interesting in the sense that they are very divided on many of these questions. It's not people think that San Francisco is a high tech city. It's also a city that's very anti high tech. It's one of the only places where you could get physically attacked for wearing Google Glass, for example. Uh, meanwhile, it's probably the place where the person who invented Google Glass lives. I mean, it's the, that kind of city. It's just uh, very divided along tech lines. And Berkeley, I believe, has the highest uh, discrepancy between the wealthiest and the poorest in the nation as a zip code. Uh, I've, I read that somewhere. Uh, so very divided uh, area. We'll see how this goes. Any predictions about where uh, what, what's going to happen with F? Well, the polling would make it look as if F is going to fail. Uh, the latest polling, the numbers I'd seen, is it's going down by about 17%. I mean, San Francisco voters are notoriously fickle. However, most of them probably already voted because you can vote by mail here. And so when you do that kind of polling nowadays, it tends to be pretty... Pretty safe. I have heard from activists, from housing activists who who are uh, proponents of Prop F, that they will come back next year. And actually, next year will be an interesting ballot because or an interesting election. It's a presidential election, which means a lot of people are going to come out, and so it might even be a better time to try. We'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Elizabeth Weiss is at USA Today, and on Twitter at e Weiss. E Weiss is spelled E W E I S E. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. You're so welcome. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right, While Amazon has launched a retail store, we learned in a piece uh, by Cranes New York that Google has decided against doing that, maybe. Erica Davies is with Cranes New York and joins us now by phone. Welcome to the show, Erica. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Now, I thought Google had already leased a space or bought a space or something in New York City. What's happening with that location? Yes, they lease a space in Soho um, for about $225 million, but I guess they decided to abandon ship again and um, nix their retail plans. Hey, Erica, think, this is Joe. I'm sorry. Uh, hey, Erica, Joe Panateri here. Um, a follow-up question on that. When you say nixed the plans, quote-unquote, again, uh, can you give us some background? I mean, has this been on again, off again for them, and might they be, be planning a different location now? Yes, um, I think this was the second attempt at Google's um, trying to open a store. Initially in 2013, they had had two barges that were in California. Uh -huh. and I guess they tried to do some sort of art gallery um, store opening on the barge, but then they had abandoned that idea earlier on last year. But apparently there are plans to open a store at the Super Pier at Pier 57 in Chelsea. Oh, the barges. I miss the barges. As a news guy, those barges were just uh, just wonderful. Uh, we were like tracking them all or, all over the place. Uh, now this space looks uh, looks really cool, and they they're going to be subleasing it. Um, do you, I, I imagine there's no information yet on who might be leasing this space or why Google wouldn't just unload it and get rid of it or or get out of it altogether? Any any additional information about the real estate uh, plays behind all this? Um, there hasn't been any information yet on who is going to lease the space, but my thoughts on uh, the, the Super Pier is that uh, they decided to close the Soho store in order to invest more into the Super Pier location. Since it's more space, they are planning to open some sort of uh, lab and like showcase to show their products in store to kind of compete with Apple and Microsoft. Well, why is it called a Super Pier? This sounds fantastic. Oh, it's just because of the space itself. I think it's more than like 500 square feet, and it's supposed to be like a retail and commercial giant. Unbelievable. That's great. I love it. Yeah, here at the Super Brick House, we're <laughs> doing all kinds of super things. <laughs> I love it. All right, well, Erica Davies is at cranesnewyork.com and on Twitter at Miss Davies underscore. Erica, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Drone maker DJI, along with the Ubuntu Linux distributor Canonical today, announced the launch of an embedded computer platform for drones. The computer is called Manifold. Right now, the system works only with DJI's $3,300 Matrix 100 drone. The Manifold runs Ubuntu, of course, and is based on a quad-core ARM Cortex-A15 processor and, an, surprisingly, an NVIDIA Kepler-based GPU. It doesn't have a monitor on it, uh, but they use that GPU for image processing and parallel processing. DJI claims that Manifold will enable, get this, artificial intelligence apps for drones. This is how Skynet begins, Joe. Artificial intelligence built right into the drone.
There you go. And then, you know, take it one step further. Um, a lot of our listeners know that Ubuntu has a big presence on Linux desktops. It also has a big presence out in the cloud. They're one of the biggest backers of OpenStack. So you can almost imagine these drones connected to some sort of overall cloud run by the Ubuntu company, uh, Canonical. So very curious to see where they take this. Absolutely. And of course, I jest, I jest about the, the AI on board. I would need it as a drone pilot. I would program it to say, don't fly into a tree, don't fly into the White House lawn, uh, don't plow into a small furry animal, uh, et cetera. And maybe it could help me. Uh, uh, you know, this is this you know the first drone that this is uh, going with is a thirty-three hundred dollar drone. I would hate to crash that in the first five seconds of flying that drone. So maybe this this kind of intelligence could help me. Anyway, in mergers and acquisitions news, gaming giant Activision Blizzard intends to acquire King Digital Entertainment for $5.9 billion. That's roughly three times the price Facebook paid for Oculus VR. Activision is best known for titles like Call of Duty, Guitar Hero, and World of Warcraft. King is best known for Candy Crush Saga. The buy gives the most, mostly console company a strong presence in mobile gaming. Is this a good move, Joe, or is this overvalued because of uh, Candy Crush Saga, which is no longer you know, which probably doesn't have a brilliant future. Yeah, I'd be a little worried about this one. This sounds like a very expensive deal. I am, uh, of course, rooting for Activision because it's one of the few game producers that that's left over from my childhood on the Atari 2600. But uh, 5.9 billion, that is a lofty price tag. It certainly is. Well, we got some uh, reader email coming, reader. We have audience email coming right up, fan email. Uh, but first I want to talk about Gazelle, one of our sponsors today. Gazelle, of course, you know them, you love them as the best place to sell your used device, and there's a really good reason for that. It's super easy. Uh, if you think that it's kind of a hassle, if it sounds like kind of a hassle to sell your old phone, your old tablet uh, over the mail, you're probably thinking, okay, I got to find a box, I got to, I got to address it, I got to take it to the post office, I got to. Do you don't have to do any of that stuff. Basically, just go to the website g a z e l l e dot com, and you choose. Sell smart, trade in for cash. There's a giant bluish green button. You click on that. You decide whether you're going to go with an, you, with, you know, you indicate whether you have an iPhone or an Android phone. You identify the exact phone, the carrier, uh, and then you indicate its condition. It's either in great condition, poor condition, whatever. And they give you a price. That is the price. They're going to give you that money. And then you say, yes, get paid. You click on the orange get paid button. And what, here's what happens next. This is the best part, in my opinion. You get a box in the mail with a sticker inside. You put your phone in the box. You put the sticker on the outside. It's already pre-addressed. Give it back to the, to the mail carrier, and you're done. All you have to do after that is spend the money that they give you. It's so easy. It's so easy. It's, it's almost as easy as just leaving it in that drawer that it's currently in. <laughs> it's really, really easy, and, and, and you'll love that the price they're going to give you for your used device. Give new life to used electronics. Trade in for cash or buy certified pre-owned. Visit gazelle.com today. That's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. And trade in your old phone. The more you wait, the less it value it's going to be. So do this right away. Well, we got an email from Jim Birch who said, I believe Mike Elgin's comments in episode 1378 was disingenuous. He stated that Android is the most compromised and insecure operating system ever and that 85% of implementation of Android have been compromised by serious security problems. This leaves the clear impression that 85% of us people who use Android devices have compromised devices. My Googling of this subject leads me to believe that he's talking about an article I found about stage fright, which says that 85% could be compromised. But Google says less than 1% have been compromised. In my mind, there's a big difference between have been and could be. It's surprising to me that Mike Elgin is sometimes a co-host on This Week in Google. He often <coughs> expresses his love of Apple devices. And, and other than him talking about Google Hangouts, I know of no other Google or Android devices he is regularly used or uses. I personally wish he would report more news and less personal opinions. Uh, we thank you for that, Jim Birch, for that email. Um, I was um, actually talking about a study that we reported on October 14th uh, that found that uh, it was uh, from Cambridge University. They found that on average, 87.7% of Android devices are exposed to at least one of 11 known critical vulnerabilities. That's the study I was referring to. And, um, and of course, both iPhone and Android 
are a mixed bag overall. Both have their fans. There are, there are people who are very passionate about Android, people who are very passionate about iPhone. And uh, again, you, you have to uh, do your trade-offs. The, the truth is that both the most secure and the least secure phones are Android phones. So the average an Android phone is uh, arguably less secure than an iPhone. But the most secure phones you can buy are all Android phones because Android's open source version has been optimized by various companies uh, like, you know, companies like uh, the Black Phone, for example, or the Granite Phone. There's a, a smattering of these phones, which we've gone out of our way to report, uh, th that are just way more secure than an iPhone. But most people don't buy those. And really, the, according to this report from Cambridge, the security of the phone is tied intimately with the frequency with which the OEM, the, the, the handset maker, issues uh, uh, upgrades or patches uh, for Android. That's one of the benefits of a closed system like Apple's. They can push these out to everybody. And, of course, on the, on the iOS platform, they get patches very quickly. Now, there have been massive vulnerabilities on the iPhone platform. Uh, but in general, uh, Android is not a super secure operating system because it depends entirely on who made the handset. Right, so there are there are literally about a thousand companies who make Android handsets in the world. Now, um, I wasn't comparing the iPhone versus Android in that. I was comparing the Chrome OS versus Android. What I was saying was, I was uh, this is before we learned that the uh, that the the well, it wasn't before we learned this, but essentially what we've uh, gathered since Google came out and 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 uh, announced officially what's going on is that. The Chrome OS platform is going to continue to exist. It's not going away. And then the, but then Chrome, uh, elements of Chrome will be combined with Android. And I was uh, uh, lamenting the idea that something would happen to uh, Chrome and wondering why that would be a good idea to combine them. And I was simply saying that, you know, you have these two operating systems where Android, on average, is not very secure. And Chrome is literally the most secure mainstream uh, end user platform there is because it's all in the cloud uh, and that's what I was saying and but in any event I uh, I appreciate your uh, your email there and I uh, thank you for that uh, email Joe any comments on on this whole question of because I don't believe you were the co-anchor when we talked about no, I will, uh, Chrome I, and Android I wasn't but I, but I I will reaffirm two of your points number one there are those hardened versions of Android out there from the specific device makers that that government users in particular are very interested that would be point one and then point two would be I too breathed a big sigh of relief when I heard Chrome OS will continue forward particularly on Chromebooks uh, we're big users around here in our house most school I shouldn't say most a lot of school systems are on it and and to your point that is one of the most secure platforms out there so so I think on both fronts uh, you're making some good points here all right and uh, you know I agree with you on, on Chrome it, it is just such a it's such an odd uh, platform and uh, and it's just it's a it's a pleasure to use if you just need a lightweight just jump in on somebody's uh, system somebody else's device and then you can wipe it clean when you're done it's a it's a really cool platform all right well we got another email from tulio troncoso who said i started watching your show this morning while looking for reviews for the apple tv that i'm definitely going to buy and just wanted to say thank you for hosting the show i've been looking for a morning tech show to watch and i'm happy to say that i'll be watching tnt daily welcome aboard to you and uh, thank you for that note and everybody out there with a with the new apple tv look for the apps uh, the, the Twit apps, there are several of them, and check them all out and choose your favorites. Well, if you've got an email to send us, send it to tnt at twit.tv. We'd love to hear from you. Our TNT fan of the day is Michael D. in Puyallup, Washington, I think I'm saying that right, who posted this boomerang on Twitter. He found himself recently listening to Tech News Today via a secret glove box media player in the car he rented. Very strange. Very strange. Looks like something's being crushed. It looks like a couple of credit cards are being smashed underneath this video. How, how weird is that? Anyway, sh everything looks weird on Boomerang. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Joe, what the heck is happening at Channel ETE? Well, uh, besides our own growth, we're watching some uh, mergers and acquisitions and exits in the market. As most listeners know by now, Channel E to E stands for Entrepreneur 
to exit. Um, and on the east side of the uh, business this week, we're watching IBM's latest acquisition. It was just announced this morning. It involves what I would call a cloud services brokerage. It basically is designed to transform websites into cloud malls where you can go and get all these different apps. So, so IBM is going to help hundreds and hundreds of customers essentially launch their own app stores for their customers, which is very interesting. The other big story we're looking at, Mike, is, as you know, Dell is buying out EMC for $67 billion. And before that deal is, is finalized, it's expected to be finalized in May, it looks like Dell may so sell off a range of hardware and software companies, particularly on the software side, which is quite interesting. Perhaps there's some overlap with EMC, and also perhaps Dell is looking to strengthen their, uh, their bottom line before spending $67 billion to buy to buy EMC. So... That's what we're tracking today. Very awesome. Can't wait to read your piece on Dell because that is just, a, a, that's the uh, gift that keeps on giving in terms of like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it sure <laughs> is. Going on? So anyway, uh, I, I have the feeling Michael Dell knows what he's doing though. I think he's got a, a good plan and he's going to pull this one off. Just a feeling I have. Joe Panateri, uh, thank you so much for coming today and we'll see you next week. Mike, thanks for having me every Tuesday. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your week. All right, you too. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Feedly, or you can choose another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. If you're in the greater Brickhouse area, come on in and watch us as part of our studio audience. Just send email to tickets at twit.tv. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash TV, and you can follow me on Facebook at facebook.com slash mike.elgin with an A. Also, don't miss our other new show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. And that is the Tech News Today. This show is produced by Jason Cleanthus and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.